You've been waiting for this moment for a very long time. Every month for the last 30 years, you've been paying into a pension. But all of that time, that money has been locked up, inaccessible. But finally, you're there. You've turned 55 and it's yours to do with as you please. Now you can finally pay off your mortgage or perhaps invest in a little buy-to-let property. Maybe even get yourself a new car. How great is that? You know, there's a very good reason why they don't let us touch our pensions. Because give us half the chance and we will screw it up. In this video, I'm going to take you through examples from clients that I have worked with to demonstrate some of the most disastrous decisions that retirees can make with their pensions. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James. I am a financial planner and it is my job to help people prepare for and navigate through retirement. Now, before we get stuck into these examples, let's just do a quick recap of how pensions work at retirement. Firstly, today we're going to be talking about defined contribution pensions, which are the most common types of pensions which most of us have through work. When you put money into a pension, you get tax relief. If you're a zero or basic rate taxpayer, you get 20%. If you're a higher rate taxpayer, you get 40%. And if you earn between 100 and 125k, you can actually get up to 60% tax relief. It's pretty good. And once money is inside the pension, it then gets invested and grows free of capital gains tax and income tax. When you reach 55, you can access your pension. However, this access age is actually set to increase to 57 from 2028, and it may even go higher in the future. When you get access to your pension, you can take 25% as a tax-free lump sum, whilst the rest of your pension can be drawn down when you need it, and it's taxed as income. In retirement, most people move down a tax bracket, so they actually end up paying less tax when taking money out of the pension than the tax relief they got when putting money in. If you're sharp, you might have recognized that once you've taken money out of a pension, you could actually funnel it back in for another round of tax relief. But unfortunately, HMRC is one step ahead of you. And once you have drawn money out of the taxable part of your pension, they then limit you to just being able to put four grand a year back into a pension. And as you're about to see, this catches a lot of people out. And finally, you don't need to take your pension benefits at 55. Instead, you can leave them inside the pension so that they can keep growing and then you can draw them when you need them. That was a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of how pensions work, but as we go through these examples, you'll start to see how these rules work in practice. A while ago, I started working with a client who had just turned 55. He was still working and a higher rate taxpayer, but like lots of retirees, he was really keen to start generating some passive income. He originally had £550,000 in his pension, but he'd used some of it to buy a buy-to-let property. He'd bought a place for 375k and was getting a 5.5% rental yield on it, or 20k per year, which he was originally pretty happy with. This was funded partly by taking cash out of his pension, but also through a mortgage. And he'd managed to secure a 3% interest rate, you can tell this was a while ago, by keeping his loan to value below 70%. So that after all other costs, he needed to take 150k worth of cash from his pension. When you punch these numbers into a buy-to-let calculator, you can see how the mortgage levers up the return on the investment to 6.37% per year. And that's without including any capital gains, which on the face of it sounds very attractive. The only problem is tax. You see, five years ago, landlords were able to write off their mortgage interest as an expense, which would result in this property producing an annual profit of almost 10 grand. But the government has now put a stop to this, which means his pre-tax profit would be £5,735, or a 4.6% return, which is still not that bad. But there were two things that he had not considered. The first is just how tax efficient it would have been if he'd kept his money inside the pension. As a higher rate taxpayer, if I invest in something that yields 10% per year, after paying income tax, I'm only left with 6% in my pocket. However, pensions grow free of income tax, which means that if we can get a 6% yield on something inside a pension, I would need to get a yield of at least 10% outside of the pension to match it. That is massive. 
And in this example, with a buy-to-let property yielding 4.6%, that would mean that we would only need a yield of 2.76% inside the pension to match it. So as an alternative, if he wanted to invest in property, he could have instead kept his money inside the pension and then invested in a property fund or a real estate investment trust. With this, it then gives him access to a whole diversified portfolio of properties. And of course, he doesn't have to do any of the work. He could even invest in multiple different funds. And as you can see here, many of these have been yielding much more than the 2.76% we would need to beat the buy to let. Of course, just like buy to let investing, Real estate investment trusts are higher risk investments and are only suitable for certain people in certain circumstances. But I've used it here as an interesting comparison to highlight the tax efficiencies of keeping money within a pension. But that's not the main reason why this was a bad idea. To fund this purchase, he needed £150,000 of cash from his pension. £125,000 came from his tax-free lump sum, whilst he had to take the other 25k from the taxable part of his pension. And as a 40% taxpayer, that required a withdrawal of £41,000. But that's not the bad part. Because he had accessed the taxable part of his pension, he had triggered the money purchase annual allowance, meaning that going forwards, he could only put £4,000 a year into his pension. But he was still working, and between himself and his employer, he was putting £9,000 a year into his pension, five grand of which would have been over his limit, which meant that he now has to pay a tax charge of two grand a year, which pretty much wipes out the majority of the profits he would make from his buy to let. I'm not saying that all buy to let property investing is bad. There are clearly ways that he could have better executed this to deliver a superior outcome. But it does demonstrate not only just how tax efficient pensions are, but why you're often better off just leaving it in there for as long as you can. In fact, once you reach 55, this is often one of the best times to be putting money into your pension rather than taking it out, which brings us on to mistake number two. This is perhaps more of a missed opportunity than a mistake, but you would really be kicking yourself if you missed this. The big downside of a pension is that you cannot access it until you are 55. So it often makes sense to build up other investments outside of your pension in case you need to use them before you can access your pension. But as you get closer to 55, you might realize that you don't actually need these assets and you can actually start to use them to make larger pension contributions. Let's expand on our last example and assume that alongside his pension, he also had 50,000 pounds invested in stocks and shares ISAs and 50K sitting in cash as he was starting to build up a cash buffer in preparation for retirement. Given that he is already 55, he can access his pension if he really needs it. So he could liquidate his ISA and use it to make larger pension contributions over the next few tax years. And as a higher rate taxpayer, he would be getting 40% tax relief on those contributions. So he would have ended up with an additional 83K in his pension. Then when he comes to draw it out of his pension, he gets 25% of that tax-free. And then let's assume that he's sensible and draws down from the taxable part once he's already retired and over a number of tax years so that he only pays 20% tax on the withdrawal, which would leave him 20K better off than if he just kept the money in an ISA. But what about his cash? This is money that he's planning on spending in the first couple of years of retirement. So he can't really afford to invest this for the long term. But he could just put the money in a pension and leave it as cash. I wouldn't recommend putting it all in just in case he does need to access some cash quickly, but let's say he puts in 40 grand and then follows the same strategy as with the ISAs and bam, he's now 37,000 pounds better off simply by shifting money between these accounts. One of the most common questions I get asked is whether you should be prioritizing putting money into your pension or into your ISA. If you're getting 45% or even 60% tax relief on your pension contributions, then often it's a bit of a no-brainer. But as you can see from this example, you can still use ISAs to get pension relief in the future, which is why it often makes sense to have a balance between the two, which also helps protect you against future changes to pension or ISA rules. So on to our final mistake. I received this comment the other day. Hi James, I've been watching a lot of your videos. And you keep saying that investing in the stock market is a long-term game for which you need at least five years to see results. The problem is that I'm only three years from retirement. 
So what should I do? Don't worry, you are not alone on this one. I get this question a lot. Let's start by zooming out for a second. Let's say you are 52 now and you want to retire at 55. How long do you expect your retirement to be? Well, if you're male in the UK, you have a 50-50 chance of living until you are 84 and a 1 in 10 chance of living until 97. Let's be conservative and assume that you're going to live until you're 97. That's 45 years from now and we'll give you 42 years in retirement. In three years time, yes, you're going to need to start drawing an income from your pension, but you don't need all of it. You're going to need some cash for the first five years and then some from 60 to 65, 65 to 70 and onwards all the way up to 97. So although some of your pension has a short investment horizon, you're not going to need the rest of it potentially for a very long time time. As we're seeing at the moment, the stock market is very unreliable in the short term. So you need to work out what portion of your assets you're going to need over the next few years and hold them in cash or lower risk investments. But for the rest of your portfolio, you still need this to be growing and working hard for you for the next 20 or 30 years. And over these time frames, the stock market is one of the best tools that we have for achieving the growth that we need. In fact, the bigger risk here is that you underinvest and then you don't get the growth that you need to sustain you in retirement. As you get closer to retirement, the general rule is that you should be de-risking your portfolio, moving from higher risk, higher returning assets like stocks to lower risk, lower returning assets like bonds. As an example, almost all new workplace pensions like this Aviva one will invest you in a default fund that automatically reduces the risk of your investments as you get closer to retirement. Pension companies do this because they know that most people do not go in and make changes to how their pensions are invested. So these products are designed to follow the life path of an average person. The only problem is that very few people are actually average and you may find that you're either taking more risk than you can handle or not enough. As an example, let's say you're 55 years old with 500k in your pension and you're planning on spending 25k per year in retirement. Let's assume that you've never made any changes to the way that your pension is invested and you're still in this default Aviva fund, which at 55 would have you invested in roughly 40% stocks, 10% property, 45% bonds and 5% cash. The question is, would this portfolio give us enough growth to sustain spending £25,000 a year in retirement? To give us an idea, we can use some software to backtest this retirement plan against the last 100 years of stock market data. And we can see from this that only in 47% of historical scenarios would this plan have been successful, which means that in 53%, we would have run out of money. Whereas if we'd instead been invested in a classic 60% stock and 40% bond portfolio, it would have been successful in 78% of scenarios, with the median scenario actually leaving us with almost 400 grand left at the end. A higher stock allocation does mean that the portfolio is going to be more volatile. It's going to be more painful in the short term. So you need to be careful to only take as much risk as you can handle. But as you can see, if you are not invested in a way that is likely to get you the growth that you need, then you are almost guaranteed to run out of money in retirement. Your pension is probably your most valuable financial asset, which is why it's so important that you know how it's invested and whether that is likely to enable you to achieve your goals. Now, a 47% success rate may not seem very high, but there are actually four levers that you can pull to dramatically increase your chances of success in retirement. And in this video here, I apply these levers to take a similar plan from a 6% success rate all the way up to 95%. So I'll see you there.